By 2400 BCE, we're seeing civilizations spread from Egypt to the Indus Valley, and they're all trading with one another. And if you remember from my last videos, in the middle of all this, in Sumer, we have roughly 20 city-states, each ruled by their own king, each with their own unique combination of gods, fighting over border disputes. But from time to time, kings would conquer more than one city. Like when I discussed King Gilgamesh, I mentioned he conquered four cities. And by the middle of the 24th century BCE, we have another Sumerian king named Lugal Zagezi conquering Sumerian cities. And soon enough, he set his eyes on the city of Kish. The king of Kish at the time was Urzababa, and his cupbearer was named Sargon, who would one day be known as Sargon the Great, ruler of the world's first empire. Now, before we move on, let's examine three words here. Cupbearer, empire, and Sargon. First, cupbearer. Now, we don't know the role of cupbearer as told by the Sumerians themselves, but we do know that the Assyrian and Persian cupbearers were in positions of authority, second only to the king. Scholars believe that Sargon was a cupbearer in the same sense, because in a moment of crisis, he was able to quickly seize power. How he got to that position though, well, it's unknown. Next, let's examine the word empire. In my past videos, I mentioned that Sumer was the world's first civilization, and Egypt was the world's first nation. Egypt gets the recognition as the world's first nation, because unlike Sumer, Egypt was able to unite all their regions, called gnomes, under one king. And Egypt was considered a nation and not an empire because before it was united under one king, it was already united under a common culture and language. So when Sargon conquered all of Mesopotamia, he imposed his culture and language onto different cultures under his rule. And it's this imposition of one culture onto the others that made it the world's first empire. And a quick side note, Sargon didn't uproot local languages and customs. Rather, he installed an Akkadian ruling class, or bureaucracy, across the entire empire, while allowing local languages like Sumerian to subsist. Sargon and his Akkadian community spoke a Semitic language that is in the same language family as Babylonian, Assyrian, and Hebrew, while the Sumerian king spoke Sumerian, an isolate language, which means it's not related to any other known language, living or dead. And the fact that Sargon allowed Sumerian to flourish and be written in cuneiform alongside Akkadian cuneiform is a major reason why we're able to read and know so much about Sumerian today. And actually, Akkadian scholars revered the Sumerian language and its text in the same way that Western scholars today revere Latin. Both may be outdated, but are necessary to preserve in order to better understand the past. And now the final word to examine is Sargon. So Sargon is not a name. The name Sargon simply means legitimate king, which leads scholars to believe that he was a conqueror rather than having a lawful claim to the throne. So we do not know his actual name or race. Once in power, Sargon claims not to have known his father and that his mother abandoned him by putting him in a basket and sending him down a river. And of course, scholars easily recognize that this story is similar to the origin stories of Moses, but happened roughly a thousand years earlier than when Christian historians or Old Testament historians believe the actual Moses lived. Is this a coincidence or is it evidence that the Old Testament has repurposed a popular story of the ancient Near East? Sargon was found on the riverbank by Aki, which is a Semitic name, who took him in as his son, raised him, and made him his gardener. Aki was employed in the palace of the king of Kish, Urzubaba, and somehow Sargon became his cupbearer. And this brings us back to where we were, the Sumerian king Lugal Zagezi attempting to conquer the city of Kish. Well, it wasn't much of a battle because King Urzubaba fled the city, and Sargon fled too, but he didn't follow his king. Rather, he collected an army of his own and attacked one of Lugal Zagezi's Sumerian cities, Uruk. Sargon took the city by surprise while its king and its army were in Kish. Upon hearing the news, Lugal Zagezi headed home to confront Sargon. Their armies met in the field and Sargon captured Lugal Zagezi. After that, Sargon continued to march south, conquering every Sumerian city along the way until he reached the Persian Gulf. There, he washed his weapons in the sea as a gesture of victory. The year was 2334 BCE. Now this is the traditional date. Historians have arrived at this date by counting 700 years backwards from the reign of the Babylonian king, Amis Aduga. But once again, as I've said many times in my past videos, this is ancient history. So even though historians are able to paint a picture of this time using the evidence, and a majority of historians will pick this date as the beginning of Sargon's reign, they are aware that they could still be off by up to about 200 years. 
So like it or not, this is something you have to get used to while casually reading ancient history, and it's also something that's constantly debated between historians. But don't worry, dates will become more precise as we start to enter the classical Greek era. So along these lines, the traditional dating for the Akkadian Empire is 2334 to 2150 BCE, maybe a little bit longer. And after Sargon's victory in 2334 BCE, he built the new city of Agade, which is where we get the name Akkad, the Akkadian language, and of course, the Akkadian Empire, the first empire in the history of the world. The remains of Agade have never been found, but some believe it's near present-day Baghdad. Sargon claimed to have conquered territory from the Persian Gulf all the way to the Mediterranean, and even boasted on controlling ships from Magan, Dilim, and Malua in the Indus Valley, which was the subject of my last video. He was able to sustain his empire by employing a professional army, probably the first professional army in the history of the world, and by also keeping the conquered ruling families at his court to help prevent uprisings across the empire. On top of that, he built a bureaucracy that was far superior to Sumer's, that could efficiently collect taxes and manage a vast empire. And he shored up these effective, practical policies by paying tribute to every local god in his empire. Sargon ruled for 56 years, and this allowed his administration to grow roots that would allow his descendants to rule for another 100 years. Ultimately, the Akkadian Empire would collapse the Gutian invasions around 2150 BCE, where they completely destroyed Agade. The Gutians destroyed the existing civilization without replacing it with another. Their inability to rule effectively allowed several Mesopotamian cities to rebel. This set the stage for Unamu, a Sumerian king, to take control of the area. His reign is known as the beginning of the Sumerian Renaissance, or more precisely, the third dynasty of Ur. So that's it, our ninth date. 24th century BCE, Sargon's first empire. Only 44 dates to go. In my next video, we'll go to an island in the Mediterranean where a minotaur may be lurking in a labyrinth. If you have any questions or know a lot already, in the comment section, please post anything you think is essential to understanding this century or this topic. If you're adding new information, please cite your sources. I'll be monitoring what's going on, and in my conclusion videos to this project, I'll highlight how we've expanded its historiography and list any questions that seem to be left unanswered. At that point, we'll have a stronger foundation for my next project and all future projects. And of course, if you're an expert and you want to share your knowledge to help guide us, please feel free to join the conversation. Or if you're interested, I'd love to interview you and post it right here. So contact me. If you just found me for the first time and are curious what this is all about, go check out my intro videos to both this project and this channel. And as always, subscribe, like, donate some money to keep the show going. Click the notification so you know when the next video is up, and I'll see you then.